Don't be a stooge. Welcome to the Locofoco Netcast, number five. The uh, subject today is the precautionary principle and the place for conspiracy conjectures. Or, don't be a stooge. We're often told that sometimes we must act as if the worst could happen, even if the worst is unlikely, because the worst is so bad. This is the precautionary principle. Now, I'm dubious about most applications of the principle, in part because of framing. That is, the prophet of doom delivers uh, the extremist message of disaster, and it is extreme, so I guess extremist, and he frames the imagined situation in such a way as to preclude other equally valid scenarios in which the same principle works against his own dire warning. Take this situation with the coronavirus. We're being corralled with little or no respect for our rights. We are being told the government must do these things to stave off the worst outcomes. Precautionary principle. But we were introduced to this contagion immediately, along with the possibility that it was a product of human engineering, leaked from a medical lab, perhaps by accident, perhaps by sabotage, perhaps with a more malign intent and a more sweeping intent. But quickly, the major news sources squelched that, right? The political players squelched it. Respectable opinion in the academic world squelched it. There was a really interesting and not very convincing article about how the structure of the coronavirus itself was such that it would not likely have been made by human beings because it didn't conform to how they would have done it, basically. Yeah, I'm not sure about all that. We were told, almost certainly, it was the result of wet markets, raising wild animals close to each other for killing them and eating them. That's something they do in China. It's a plausible story. It's a likely story. But it's not a certain story. As I argued with Emil Feneff last week, on Locofoco Netcast. If you were Dr. Evil and sought to engage in an international power play using a major contagion as weapon, and if you wanted to hide your activity, you would release it in Wuhan. That would be cover. And as David Icke notes, if you register the infection patterns in America's public enemy number one, Iran, and do not at least suspect a weaponization, are you a mark? Are you a sap? Are you a willing victim? You might be a stooge the useful idiot of malign forces. Now, you don't have to believe in the conspiracy conjecture. You don't have the evidence. Neither do I. But if you resist thinking about the possibility, you are an easy mark for the worst of our species. And we know that the worst of our species can be very bad indeed. Belief is not at issue. It is suspicion and caution that the precautionary principle requires. It's right there in the term. We do not know if the coronavirus was deployed as an instrument of social control, but we do know that it is being used as if it were. All of a sudden, politicians and lots of people are rushing to put the state into totalitarian action. The current quarantine is the biggest hit capitalism has taken since communism. It's bigger than World War II, at least in extremity, because at least in World War II, our private economies were not basically shut down. So, it would be a form of the precautionary principle to act as if the coronavirus had been deployed as a weapon and therefore resist tyrannical paternalism and instead promote distributed responsibility as the way to increase the safety of the population. Note what I'm saying here. If the precautionary principle seems to require a fixation on an extremely bad outcome of a contagion, just so it requires us to consider that it is being used as a means of suppressing freedom. Belief in the face of the unknown is not relevant probability comes into play in cultivating wisdom, as do other principles of prudence. To those of you who reject conspiracy theories out of hand, I say don't be a stooge, either to a possible malign organization or organizations, or to the tricky nature of a system spinning out of control and being squeezed into a new form of dangerous control. Free people aren't stooges. What I just said is pretty much what I wrote on my blog, workman.com. That's workman with an I, not an O. And I got a response. I got a response that basically said, I don't think the elite needs a conspiracy to take advantage of this relatively common event, as noted throughout civilized history. Well, that wasn't my point. Of course they can. That was part of the deal. I'm saying that we should act as if they were planning it because that's one of the ways that we get ourselves to think right about what they want to do. You consider the worst case and you use that as one of the reasons 
to act. This is the, what the precautionary principle means. It doesn't mean that the worst is going to happen if you don't do anything. It's that you're using the worst as a spur to action. That's the idea. And I'm saying that this applies as much to a conspiracy theory to take away our freedoms as it does to anything else. Sure, the disease will kill people. It, diseases like this do. It may be worse than the normal flu. It certainly is in Italy and a few other places. Not so much here, but we'll see how it goes. But what I'm saying is that our reaction to it has to be very careful because this is precisely the kind of thing that would be used by people with malign intent. And those malign people, they're in government. That's what they do. We don't know how deep this goes. We don't know if this is a plot or not. Does it matter? Well, I'm saying that you should consider the plot idea when you are prescribing measures to prevent the worst. Because one of the worst things that could happen is that this is an instrument to take away your freedoms. And if you allow being afraid of death or a loved one's death to take away everybody's freedoms and to make us all serviles, then you've lost it. Because this is always in front of us. This is the other thing that people don't seem to get. We're always in the position every day with every policy of using harm to a few as an excuse to make us all unfree. This is not new. There's nothing new about this. And I think that people should be more cognizant of how dangerous what's going on now because they can take away more freedom now and provide more precedent to take away more freedom in the future than ever before. And frankly, this does look like an exercise, which is actually what Pompeo said, isn't it? We're in a live exercise here. I mean, that should disturb you, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? So, disambiguate. What is it we're really dealing with here? We're dealing with a threat or a menace. We're dealing with a menace and we may be dealing with a threat. That is, there may be something worse than just the normal problems here. Just a thing that we see all the time. What is it what is my friend Al Hunter says? He says, um, a relatively common event. Well, there were a number of events like this in the Obama administration about which nothing was made. It wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal at all. People died of these events. We survived, and we didn't make a big deal of it because they didn't want to make Obama the person, the go-to person to bring tyranny in. See, there's a, there's there could be some really interesting things at play here, and it's not just getting Trump elected or not reelected, right? It could be something else, and so we should be very clear that a lot's on the line here, and it's not just the lives of some people. You know, every one of us is going to die, but every one of us does not need to be a slave. And that's where this gets interesting and where the standard libertarian arguments still hold. And libertarians have to be very, very forthright about it. We're not going to turn ourselves slaves so that some boomers can live. I'm a boomer. I mean, I'm at a higher at-risk category than most people. But I don't want the country to become slaves and shut-ins and shut down all commerce by government fiat just so that I have a slightly better chance of surviving the next year. You know, freedom is still practical. There are many things we can do without being bullied by government and without being turned into serviles. The joke made by my friend Jim Gill that freedom is impractical at this time, that is how politicians and activists like to think of it. That is how every step away from freedom, every step away from liberty is made, is with the idea that right now it's impractical. It's fine. It's just practical. There's a lot of things we can do in a free society. It would probably be handled better. Conspiracies challenge the way we think. Scientists don't like them, for example, because the information about them is deliberately hidden. Though scientists regularly explore the hidden aspects of nature, searching for regularities, the non-obvious phenomena they explore are not usually hidden from them consciously. They can seek data and have some confidence that they can collect that data. The secret life of beavers, for instance, can be explored by the zoologist in part because the secretive behavior of the beavers is no match for the cleverness of the scientists. But the problem with conspiracies is that the conspirators can be smarter than the scientists. James Randi, the magician and skeptic, claimed that it was easy to fool scientists. Scientists were simply not trained to see through the centrifuge of magicians. 
Jacques Vallée, the French investigator of UFOs, noted that many scientists were leery of that subject because the phenomena appeared deliberately evasive and a challenge to their procedures, which expect to find causality, not teleology, much less an oppositional teleology. Vallée argued that because of the evasive nature of the UFO phenomena, it had to be approached more in the manner of a criminal investigation. A criminal investigator may rely upon skilled scientific technicians, but investigation of crimes is not a scientific matter as such. The pretensions of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Quincy, and a host of subsequent TV cop shows notwithstanding. Mainly what really smart people dislike about conspiracies is that they make us look foolish. That's it, really. Better to deny them as an area for rational speculation and investigation than be made to look like idiots all the time. And we do get to made look pretty bad. You see... We want to be right. But if someone is hiding something from us, being right is especially hard. And here is where we can be manipulated very easily. There's an old saying, the best trick the devil ever played was to convince the world he did not exist. Well, swap the word conspirators for the devil and you get the idea. And it is a great trick. It is easily pulled off. For the smart people, especially the moderate brights, are moved by a strong desire for in-group praise. And if you get just a few insecure intellectuals to score in a subject that vexes them, and that sure is easy, you can get a whole lot of them to pretend that conspirators do not exist or not in enough number to investigate. Thus, a famous conspiracy theory runs, the CIA floated the term conspiracy as a meme of derision, a term of opprobrium to deflect folks from looking hard at a real conspiracy, the JFK assassination since what really happened in Dallas was, in Bob Dylan's crypt phrase, murder most foul, and not just a matter of a lone gunman, and implicated more than one arm of the deep state, the CIA had every interest in throwing smart people off the scent. Again, I claim little knowledge, I have suspicions, but I do think that the mechanisms by which smart people protect their precious reputations from challenge is key to the modern, is to key to much of modern psyops. It is the cowardice of intellectuals in the face of such issues that keep conspirators, such as those in the CIA, in their seats of power. It is easy to manipulate people by use of fear. We see it in the case of the coronavirus, yeah, but look at it deeper. The fear of looking foolish is really effective. The key, in my opinion, is to develop a rational epistemic about such matters, a practical and nuanced view of investigative procedures, and a willingness to speculate without deciding what you believe. Belief is irrelevant. And Poké is the answer. But there's another element here, too. There's the element of prophecy. And I think people are not thinking very clearly about what it means to be a prophet and to engage in prediction and to engage in action in the face of uncertain knowledge. I think people are being very unclear about all this. The problem with prophecy is that prophesying can change outcomes. Ask Jonah. He said Nineveh would be destroyed. In exoriating the Ninevites, they repented. They were then forgiven, Holocaust averted. So, was Jonah a bad prophet because his prophecy did not come true? No, he was a bad prophet because he yearned for Nineveh to be destroyed. The opposite effect can also be true. The self-fulfilling prophecy. As when a prediction sets the situation up for the prediction to come true. This is all related to the Thomas theorem, which states that imagined causes have real effects. So the very idea of prophecy links directly to important ideas in sociology and social psychology. And economists also understand this pretty well, or should as when the warning of a panic causes a panic, or contrarywise, when warning of disaster spurs folks to prepare for disaster and therefore mitigates or even prevents disaster. And generally economists understand that predictions of a specific variety are well nigh impossible. The current pandemic has multiple instances of possible prophecy problems, as should be painfully obvious. Prediction is a tricky business. Most people in the prediction biz are therefore also in the influence biz, when we engage in predictions, we often find ourselves taking sides on outcomes, no matter how horrific. Just ask Jonah. All of this is part of a very complex social system with feedback loops that we can't all predict. Because sometimes your prophecies are going to prevent the thing from happening, and sometimes your prophecies are going to make the thing happen. 
Are there some people who understand this better than others? Yes. Are they in power? I don't know. I didn't used to suspect so. Looking at politicians, I just basically see them as people who know how to get elected. But there are people within the deep state who do know. There are people who are very, very rich. That's probably how they gain and maintain their wealth, is through knowing how to manipulate the prophecy biz. And that's why I am very concerned about the nature of prophecy and the precautionary principle, because we do not want to be led by a false sense of certainty regarding the prophecy that's given us. So we're told that things are going to get very, very bad. So we let government do all sorts of horrific things to us. And so we find ourselves in a very, very bad situation down the road or right immediately. I mean, things are awful now. You realize that both in China and Italy, people are rioting and looting because they can't get food because they've been put out of work. This is really bad. And it is showing that the solution of government action has its limits, really strong limitations, I should say. The limitations of totalitarian action to prevent a harm are serious and should be seriously questioned. And there's something else. In a recent video by Richard and Tracy Dolan, Richard Dolan goes on a rant about who he has little tolerance for, has little, little patience for. Stay indoors. Let this thing run itself out. Well, already I'm in disagreement with him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought I was going to go right into the meat of his uh, talk, and I can't do it because I don't know if staying inside is a good idea. People should go out for walks. But did you see that people in Britain are allowed only one exercise, walk, or run a day? Outside is a good place for you. You're not going to, if you just don't get close to people, you're not going to be recirculating disease out, out of doors. I don't think that's the case. I think you should be out Go into the woods, jeez. I think there's something really wrong with this shut-in idea. And in fact, if you have an older person in home or somebody with damaged or compromised lungs, if you have one of those people there, maybe you shouldn't be around them all the time. Maybe you should actually be masked when you're by them. And that you should be outside more often. Maybe you should separate yourself out. People who are strong from the weak and protect the weak, that's the responsible thing to do. I really don't like this idea of everybody being inside. I think you should go outside more often. I hope the weather gets better real quick. There was this whole deal about people going to the beach, too. I realize that kids in Florida on spring break are nuts and too close to each other. But, you know, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and going to the beach is largely a solitary activity. Maybe this is one reason why the Swedes have gotten away with almost no major hits to their economy, because... People keep their distances and know how to in Scandinavian countries. America, as uh, somebody at Liberty Magazine used to say, is a nation of scandalous overhuggers. Stop it, people. <laughs> anyway, back to Richard Dolan, where he makes his main point. We all, most of us, lived through 9-11, and we all know how we were just completely lied to and hosed by that event. It was very obvious to many diligent researchers in the quick aftermath of that, there was something wrong. And within a few years, it was a, a large community of researchers. And now we're 20 years into that whole post 9-11 nightmare. And I think most thinking people realize, yeah, that was a big pack of lies. And it created the ultimate false flag to turn our world into a, into a police state. So we've all lost trust with our political institutions. We've all lost trust with our media, rightly so, rightly so. But now I'm hearing people say the virus is simply a plan by the elites to keep you all inside and to and to chip you. Bill Gates with his vaccine is going to microchip your health. And make no mistake, a lot of that nasty stuff is going to happen. It's going to happen. But this is what I'm saying right now. All right. This virus is not a game. This virus is not a fake. This virus is not a hoax. It could be totally man-made out of the bio four, uh, bio, level four bioweapons lab out of China. Probably, all right, there are arguments about, about each permutation of this, but yeah, probably. Was it done deliberately or did it come out by accident? I don't know. And guess what? You don't know either. No one out there really knows this. Uh, could very well be man-made. But the fact is, it's out. 
And it took, what was the first, uh, from zero to 100,000 infect, uh, total infections that we know 67 about. 67 days. 67 days. And then the next 100,000. 11 days. 11 days. From 67 days to reach 100,000, another 11 days to reach 200,000. And then it was three, four, three or four, four, days. four days to reach another 100,000. All right. So that is what we call exponential growth. And that is no game. Now, fortunately, the mortality rate is lower or it seems to be lower than what it's like when it was coming out of China at 3.4%. That was outrageously high. It now seems you get people basically saying 1%. No one really knows. In Italy, it's really high. In other places, it's high. Elsewhere, it seems to be lower. Let's just say 1%. So that makes it 10 times more deadly than a flu and way, way, way more contagious. So that's where we're at. I have a family member who's in an intubator right now in an ICU, you know, and I'm sure many of you have people now that you know where this is happening to them. So this is very widespread and we're only beginning. So again, I've got no time for those people who are like, ah, no big deal. I'm just going to go out. I'm going to do my thing. Flights are cheap and I'm just going to go kill grandma because I don't really give a crap and I'm fine, and I'm just going to like let the hospital system get crushed in a tidal wave that it cannot handle. I've got no patience for that, and I have really very little patience for those people who are absolutely convinced that they know everything about how this started and that they know it's a plot by the elite. Newsflash, everything is a plot by the elite. Everything is used by those people with power to manipulate the world for their benefit. That is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean we should not be doing everything possible right now. It doesn't mean that we should do everything possible right now. Most things possible to solve a problem are bad things. That's what living in, in a free society is all about, is that you discount and you rule out of bounds a whole bunch of things that could be done. We could solve all sorts of problems by just turning people into drones, turning them into robots, turning them into nothings, not even human. And Richard Dolan knows this. He's just gotten caught up. Well, he has a family member that's in bad condition. I've read a lot of insane things worse than Dolan's elsewhere on Facebook by reputable people who, because of their illness, are freaked out. Well, stop freaking and realize that not everything is going to be done for your sake. It really doesn't require that everything be done. Most things shouldn't be done, even if some of them would prevent problems. Because, you know, this world isn't one where you solve problems in public policy. There are only trade-offs. There are only trade-offs, and that means some of the trade-offs means that you have to accept higher casualties for other good outcomes, like the fact that people aren't going to starve to death in India and starve to death in Italy and China because they've been prevented from working. This is a bad situation, and we cannot go off half-cocked because you think that doing everything in your power is a good idea because we have a bad situation. That's simply not the case now, nor is it ever the case. We're all going to die sometimes. Some of us are going to die in the next few days. I may not survive this, but I'm not asking everybody to become slaves or become peons so that I can survive. That's a, a horrendous idea. No one should be asking that. And people who are in the risk category by age, boomers, should realize that they have to stop. They have to stop and step up and realize and proclaim that they do not want to be the reason that people kill the country that kill any possibility of freedom. We're not going to allow the elites to do all that they can and all the, all the, take all the advantages that they possibly can. And it's not just the elites. It's these stupid governors who go too far. There are a thousand ways of making society better during a contagion, and really we need to start thinking about them in a context of freedom and personal responsibility and a culture of respect, not just in terms of edicts, government edicts. We live in a society where people are beginning to think just as if they're nothing more than, I don't know, what is going on here? This is disgusting. 
Anyway, Richard Dolan's a great guy. He usually talks a lot of sense. This has a few things I dislike, mainly that we've got to do everything in our power to save a few people. That's not true. I know it sounds awful because we must do everything to help everybody, you know, but it just doesn't work like that. That's not the way life and policy is made in a responsible, accountable system. Whatever that government would be, and I'm talking about there are many forms of government that we could be talking about and not just our alleged democracy. There's many options. And people, I think we have to stop talking about as if we're going to solve a problem. There are no solutions to this problem. We only accommodate and make do and improve what we can. And we don't want to give up everything so that everybody's safe. And this whole bailout mentality, this it's insane. People are, I guess people are screaming, oh, save us, save us, because we might die. And politicians say, oh, what can we do? Oh, let's bail out the banks. Let's give trillions of dollars to the banks. That's a perfect solution. Yeah. Uh, the only hero in this whole fracas may have been Representative Massey from Kentucky, the one that everybody is, hates right now, because he demanded that the politicians be accountable for a huge and idiotic scheme. And this is huge and it is idiotic. We should be doing the things that make sense. Mr. Speaker, I came here to make sure our republic doesn't die by unanimous consent in an empty chamber, and I request a recorded vote. Well, that was Representative Massey from Kentucky trying to get Congress to go on the record about their biggest spending bill in history. And this has been Local Poco Netcast, which you can find on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and other services. My name is Timothy Verkula. You can find me on social media at at Workman. And my blog is at workman.com. Look for this podcast at locofoco.net and communicate with the team at locofoco.us. Oh, let's do a final thought. Here we go. Intellectuals as a class were long ago parasitized by the memeplex of subjugation and servility. It takes many forms, socialism being only the most obvious. With the coronavirus panic and quarantine, we see this method rolling out in the general population. It is a very hard meme to resist. We should try.